welcome. I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> yeah, are the panelists ready for me today? <laughs> are you guys ready for everyone? Okay. All right, I guess uh, we will get started right about now. Okay, guys, uh, nice to meet everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm Kay. Uh, I'm a super duper active investor here in Silicon Valley. And today uh, we have a special audience, uh, but also welcome to the second episode of the Future of Work series. Uh, we're gonna dive into it. Uh, I guess maybe starting off, I'd like to give some, uh, uh, well, first give thanks to the organizers. We got DCH, we got CTS, which is Cognitive Talent Solutions, as well as HR Tech Hub. Uh, we're gonna dive into it, uh, maybe do some introductions uh, going around. Uh, Sulian, could we start with you and maybe go with Alan and Graham? Sure, thank you, Kai. Hi, uh, everybody. My name is Shirin, based at Silicon Valley, California. Uh, I have a global uh, HR consulting experiences for over 15 years. Hi, thanks for uh, having me today. I'm Al Adamson. I'm the founder and CEO of Pafau Inc. Pafau stands for People, Analytics, and Future of Work. I'm also a founder of Insight 222. And I also am all about people data for good, which is promoting the ethical and responsible use of people data analytics and AI for the benefit of individuals, teams, groups, organizations, and society at large. Awesome. And my name is Graham Davis. I'm in Austin, Texas, and I'm an entrepreneur at Indeed, where our mission is to help people get jobs. Uh, I've been at Indeed for 12 years. I've worked on many of Indeed's uh, technology and product innovations from the ground up. And so not an entrepreneur, uh, but an entrepreneur within, within the larger company of Indeed. Thank you for having me. Okay, awesome. And uh, yeah, as we get started here, uh, I, I wanna make sure the audience feels uh, completely comfortable. So feel free to ask questions anytime. I will uh, do my best to bring the questions up to the panelists. Uh, but enjoy the the episode for today so let's get started on the first question and we'll go around uh we got two questions today uh two major questions and then after that we're going to break out into the last 30 minutes for q a with the audience uh and then we'll close it out for the hour so uh let's get started the first question that we have okay how did you contribute to your organization's workforce planning strategy and what challenges did you face Sulin, could we start with you sure so as the global HR advisor, my biggest takeaway is that there's a no one size fits all solution in the HR world. However, there are some similar practice among different industries and different sectors. Workforce planning is one of them. In general, when we talk about the workforce planning, which is means bring the right people at right position at the right time. So there are two factors usually we need to consider. One is bring the external candidates, and another one is the internal succession plan. For the external hires, I would like to share one example from Ghana. That company is a partner with the United Nations uh, to implement some IT solutions in different regions. So they have the biggest challenge. One is they have to experience the international organization's long process, approval process here. And on the other hand, once the project got awarded, they need to hire as many people as possible to meet the project deadline. So how can they face these uh, challenges? My suggestion to them is to have enhanced the internal communication. Before they submit a project to the United Nations, they have to inform the HR department on how many engineers at what skill level from which regions will be hired. Therefore, the HR department can conduct a talent mapping exercise and analyze the external job market. And for the internal succession plan, I can share one example from India Digital Marketing Company. When I coach them to prepare a next five years transformation plan to transform people's strategy into the business strategy, I ask them to identify who is the informal leaders? Who is the promotable employees? Who, which employee can take one step or two steps away for the higher positions that we are going to fill the, in the near future? So by doing this exercise, the company come up uh, 
five years workforce planning plan to support the business needs. Therefore, um, in the summary, I think data analytics, people analyst skill are very useful for the workforce planning. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Suleen. So Al, same question to you. It's how did you contribute to your organization's uh, workforce planning strategy and what challenges are you facing today? Well, I'm gonna, I have not been in a role for 17 years. So I created uh, the people analytics capability at Gap Inc. in the early 2000s. Workforce planning was uh, a process that I uh, added value to by bringing the data to help formulate strategies that related to recruiting, internal development, and so forth. But what I will do is answer this within the context of uh, Walt Disney Animation Studios, who I had the pleasure of working with. Um, at the time, uh, Wreck-It Ralph was in production, uh, Frozen was right behind that, and then Big Hero 6. And going back in history, uh, Disney acquired uh, Pixar. However, it was more of a reverse acquisition insofar as Pixar's leadership came over to Walt Disney Animation Studios. And formerly Walt Disney Animation Studios had created one feature film every 24 months. And the mandate that came down was that we're now going to re release one feature film every 12 months. So we're going to double our capacity. We're going to do that without increasing headcount. And we're going to change the way we're going to manage talent, where formerly the artists, as we're called, were part of a show. And as soon as that role on that show was done, they were out on the street. Now they're going to be employees of the studio. So I was retained to come in and help design processes and systems that would help facilitate internal movement, recruiting strategy, AKA workforce planning. However, what was happening was that you'd go in for a workforce planning meeting talking about how we're gonna prepare for the future and everything gravitated to the here and now. So they weren't able to plan. It's like, I don't wanna talk about, you know, six months from now, a year from now, three years from now, I need something next week, if not right now. So one of the things that I have long advocated before and since then, it, and it's rooted in a Chinese proverb, the beginning of wisdom is calling things by their right names. So what that meant in this context is what is workforce planning? Let's define it. Let's, let's get on the same page in terms of what it is, what its purpose, who's the audience for it. So fast forward, what we had done is create a meeting uh, of called strategic casting, which is really talent deployment. It was really about the here and now, the very short term. Workforce planning was really about the medium term. So six, 12, 18 months. And then I'll come back to that in a second. And then there was a third meeting actually called workforce visioning, where we're looking three, five years out and looking at disruptions in the market, location strategies, things that would be a heavy lift. So going back to workforce planning where I'll land, it had four specific purposes to inform recruiting strategy, internal development slash mobility strategy, uh, contracting or outsourcing strategy. So who we're going to partner with. And also finally, um, how we're going to design the organization. So, you know, what is going to be the span of control? You know, what's going to be the actual uh, way we're going to get work done. So that was very clear uh, relative to where they were. So I would encourage anybody who's going to engage in workforce planning to spend time defining what the heck it is, who's the audience for it, and what's the outcome that's going to be achieved, because ultimately, it's an ongoing iterative process. It's not an event that just, you know, you're done <laughs> and high five and walk out of the room. It, it truly is ongoing. And, and I'm sorry, could you define those three categories that you just said one more time? Talent deployment, workforce planning, and workforce visioning. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I love the way you structure that. Thank you for that, Al. Mm -hmm. uh, Graham, same question to you. How did you contribute to your organization's workforce planning strategy and what challenges did you face? Yeah, so <clears throat> similarly to Al, um, I haven't been in a workforce planning role myself, but I, uh, as part of Indeed's product and, and technology development, have been uh, engaged with clients who are doing workforce planning. And uh, similarly to Al, 
surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly to many of you, you know, many of the organizations we work with don't do a lot of workforce planning. Uh, they either don't have enough time to do it, uh, they haven't prioritized it in the organization, or they don't have enough data. And so uh, one of the ways that we've helped our clients is, you know, we make time for them by helping them outsource or use technology to automate some of the more routine tasks uh, that HR has to do in acquiring talent, uh, like screening resumes or scheduling interviews so that they can have time for more strategic activities. Uh, prioritizing workforce planning by helping them make the business case with dollars. So how much revenue is lost each day that a needed role goes unfilled? And you know how much can you bring down that time in uh, filling the roles you need by proactively planning and planning ahead? Uh, so you know, making that space in the organization to do the activity by making a business case, um, and then helping them get the data they need. You know, one of the pitfalls, and I, th I, I feel like we're probably going to talk a lot about data today because it's really at the heart of workforce planning. One of the pitfalls we've seen is uh, looking at internal data only and thinking about workforce planning from the need side. What do I need? What does my organization need? And ignoring the context of the market and the supply right. and demand of the talent in the market. And that's where I think a lot of the, uh, the friction comes in with workforce planning meets the reality of the market demand and now your plan doesn't really make sense anymore. And so that's, uh, I think, something that we can talk about a lot today. Um, you know, how do we partner with vendors and consultants to get external data and external perspective on that market uh, dynamics that you can incorporate that into your planning? Hey, mm -hmm. Kay, may I jump in real quick? Okay, I want to show, I, I have chills based on what he just said. <laughs> 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 so, okay, Kay, may I jump in real quick? Yeah, no, go for it. Because I, I just want to uh, bring that, uh, home a little bit from my uh, perspective and experience. So many organizations have, oh, we've done workforce planning. We've had a start and stop. Oh, it's never been a priority. And so, oh, we don't have the right data. We don't have the right technology. So there's all kinds of excuses. And so what I strongly advocate is taking what I call a process centric approach. In other words, have the discussion first, get the right people in the room, start talking about where you think the world is going, and then you're going to identify needs and then you can go source the appropriate data, the appropriate technology. So many think, OK, I need a workforce planning solution. I want to do workforce planning. Therefore, I need to go acquire a technology. That is absolutely not the way to do it. Thing I'll say, too, is that we, if we're going to be doing this work, need to be educated shoppers because the idea that we're going to throw a bunch of data in a database out pops the answer is not the right mental model. There's external data now, there's great tools, and I won't go through the laundry list, but suffice it to say, there is there are a lot of tools out there that can help facilitate this process, but you have to have a clear intention on how you're going to use those before you listen to some salesperson tell you it's going to you know, just you know, make gold. So anyway, process-centric approach, get the right people in the room, have the discussion, then go shopping. Right, right. No, I, I love the, the relationship that, you know, over at Indeed, you guys look at the internal data. Basically, I guess all the people that come to you produces that internal data. But then, like, you're also looking at external data, what the market demands. And I think a lot of people don't really look at that. So that, that, that insight is super valuable. Yeah, and, you know, the data is hard to come by. Uh, Indeed is in a somewhat unique position in that we have all the jobs on our site and we have a lot of the job seeker population. So we see that market dynamic very, yeah. uh, very closely. Um, but I'm sure you we're not the only ones who have data like that. Uh, and maybe multiple data sources pulled together. You can kind of triangulate on the picture. Uh, so, I, 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 so I have a question on that. So if you have that level of data and you see the trajectory of jobs are going this way, the, the, the human capital talent is increasing, and then you're looking at the pool of your existing human capital talent and you see a spread. Yeah. Right? So, so then do you, how, how do you cover for that? Like, oh, you tell you guys got to go retrain and meet their expectation where the technology is going or how, how is that? I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, totally. There's, there's, I think there's a multitude and other panelists will weigh in here as well. There's a multitude of solutions, I think, to help kind of bridge the gap. Uh, yeah. One is you mentioned is training programs. Um, mm -hmm. you know, certainly, if you can see that far ahead and you have large scale needs, yeah. setting up a training program uh, internally or externally where you hire someone to train them on the job 
uh, you know, could make sense. Uh, another tool is, you know, negotiating with your hiring managers on requirements mm. and uh, changing the nature of the role you're looking for to meet the, de- the, the supply that's available. Or you could break up your roles into multiple roles uh, or spread out those skills uh, that you need into different job categories so that, you know, you're kind of matching what you need as a sk- at the skill level with what the market has at the role level. Sometimes yeah. we make up roles that don't really exist in terms of people's skill sets in the market. And so yeah. it's important to know that and uh, design your workforce to meet the, the supply, uh, you know, so that you're not mismatched. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating perspective that you have over there at uh, at Indeed, and, and just me me being a very active like guy that looks at you know venture capital or uh, hyper technology, I would say, I'm seeing that the human capital needs to really evolve to the next level here, especially with distributed technologies or you know blockchain and all that. It's going to get a lot more dynamic. So, yeah, yeah, I should I, mention I, one more one more tool that's yeah. really important, and that is salaries. Mm-hmm. You can change the market and, and supply and demand dynamic uh, for your company by offering more money in the market and change, you change that dynamic. And so I actually, I, I hope, you know, we're in a moment right now where there's a huge supply and demand mismatch. Yeah. Uh, the gross uh, over demand and under supply of, of talent in the market. And I hope that we see uh, wages increase, uh, especially for those jobs that are, uh, you know, the most underpaid right now. I think that, you know, those kind of market corrections are part of the solution. That, that is absolutely incredible that you say that. I, I, I really enjoy the insight. Okay, but we got to move on to the next question here for all the panelists. So uh, going to round two of questions, starting with uh, uh, Sulian, what's your perspective on the role of technology in designing a successful workforce planning strategy? Oh, I see. Sure. It's a good question. Since, you know, by hearing all the panels discussion, I think we all agree, you know, in any industry right now, data is the new oil, right? Mm -hmm. So our professionals need to apply those type of concept. Therefore, I'm thinking, you know, as the people analytical uh, develop itself, technology is going to play an increasingly important role in designing workforce planning. One example I can think of uh, right now is called the uh, organizational network analyst. I think there are three major values that organizational network analysts can add on to the future workforce planning. Number one, it can help the company to visualize and analyze employees' interaction by leveraging the passive and the active data sources. And number two, it can help the company to uh, infer their team's workload capacity by monitoring their burnout risk and the productivity through the analysis of a collective tool like Office 360, uh, 365. I can give one example. For example, if the data shows a team has a low productivity, high burnout risk, which means this team has a low workload capacity and the management needs to take a further action to do the organizational diagnostic. But on the other hand, if the team has a high productivity, lower burnout rate, which means you know the team can absorb more great workload, or maybe from the company side, we can add a more challenging project to this team. And the third one is organizational network analysts can help the company to identify who is the informal leader who is the promotable employee. Again, this information is highly actionable in the context of organizational development and workforce planning. Since we can prioritize to the retention of the informal leaders and leverage their uh, influence in the terms of the change management and the uh, leadership management initiative. So therefore in general, I firmly believe organizational network analysts can help both leadership and HR teams uh, to force the informal decision-making process and also reduce the bias in terms of workforce planning. Thank you. Awesome, thank you for that, Sudian. Uh, Al, let's, let's, uh, let's ask you the same question. What's your perspective on the role of technology in designing a successful workforce planning strategy? Well, I, I love what Sudian said. Um, and let me put it in, 
in this way. Uh, when we talk about workforce planning, well, what is workforce? Uh, workforce is a bunch of human beings. And I want to pick up on the notion of capacity because it's something that has been underappreciated and thus it has uh, compromised the well being of people. And so behind me is Jeffrey Pfeffer's book, Dying for a Paycheck. And we've had this uh, model in our society and it's gone around the world where you know, we're going to have a bunch of work and we're going to throw it at people and we're going to trust that they're going to figure it out. And the high value work is going to get done and the less value work is going to fall off the wayside. And if you are a caring, hardworking person, you're going to work as hard as you can to get your contribution done, you know, to meet expectations. And that means a 40 hour work week turns into 50 to turns into 60, which turns into an 80 hour work week, which compromises health, compromises relationships. And also wanted to add also technological productivity has gone up significantly. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah, 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 exactly. And, you know, then there's distractions of social media and all this stuff, but ultimately, and now with COVID, you know, you have women in particular, women exited the workforce in droves because there are child care constraints, there's elder care constraints, there's things, and it happens for men as well. So what I'm getting into this with regards to workforce planning and technology is that we now have the ability through organizational network analysis and other means to understand the human experience. You know, what is the work? What, what is the number of meetings? What are the asks, you know, with OKRs and all these technologies that are shedding light on what is happening and what's not happening. And for leaders not to use that to right size the workforce, to right size the workload on an individual basis is, in my view, unethical and irresponsible. It compromises not only organizational productivity, it compromises the well-being of the individuals as we shared. So to bring this home is that, yes, there are workforce planning solutions and there are technologies that can shed light on the supply of talent in the market, the constraints that we have in acquiring that talent geographically, monetarily, and, and otherwise. And should they be part of workforce planning processes? Absolutely, yes. Um, we have to ultimately understand what our projected supply and demand in our organization is. In other words, how many do we have to hire? How many do we have to promote? What's our retention strategy? You know, that and what's our org design strategy? You know, it's really, we need a work strategy. How is work going to get done? And among that kind of ecosystem of work, who are going to be employees? High, employees, ideally, high competitive advantage, long-term outlook. And then I won't go through the whole mental model right now, but just suffice it to say, we really have to understand where we're going. Many organizations don't. Then we have to understand, again, the constraints in the external marketplace, there are technologies for those. So we need a systematic approach. I've been criticized over the years. Al, that's too complex. We're not there yet. I've heard all the excuses. Again, in this day and age, it is a choice not to be prepared. There are the systems process technologies that will enable you to be more prepared. You got to get the right people in the room, have the discussions and go and get the work done. Final thing, every technology that an organization uses is generating data, as you know. So, you know, that data needs to be at least audited and there needs to be conscious decision on what's going to be analyzed and not analyzed because this can get to an ethical boundary really quick. And so having proper governance, not only around data governance and security, but around analytical projects where there's boundaries to say, we're not going to do that for reasons that you know, we might not know yet, but really having an ethics charter, you know, something that creates these boundaries is going to be immensely uh, important because we don't want to compromise trust within the workforce as we generate, as we analyze this data. So right, that's right. what I'll land. Yeah. It sounds like uh, both you, Sulian and Al, you guys have a, a common view on, on the two. Uh, let's, let's move over to uh, Graham. Same question to you. Uh, what's your perspective on the role of technology in designing a successful workforce planning strategy today? 
Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I think technology and digital transformation is at the heart of workforce planning. Uh, I see kind of four major trends in the future of workforce planning. One, we've talked about a lot today, and that is data, 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 data. Uh, I see more availability of large scale data for forecasting. As Al mentioned, we're generating more data ever than ever before, and we'll this will continue the more and more we move into technology platforms. And so we can use this data for, for forecasting. Uh, the second is you know, managing the supply side further upstream. We talked a little bit about this uh, as well earlier. You know, don't wait until the day before the test to cram uh, and study. You, know, you have to, uh, once you've used that data to forecast a shortfall in the talent you need with the, the supply that the market has, you need to start building those programs to close the gaps. You can't, you can't create a training program overnight. And so uh, for some of those longer term strategies, you really need to be thinking ahead and working ahead to do it. Uh, so I see more and more uh, of that kind of proactive upstream management as we start to use the data to look further out. Um, on the opposite side, I also see more just in time hiring. So planning is planning. It's not, you know, crystal ball. It's not predicting. It's not uh, writing things in stone. It's, it's a plan. And then th things unexpected happen. And your best plan doesn't always work out as you expect it to. And so you also have to have strategies that can be very nimble and agile and flexible in the moment. And so I see an increased, um, I would say, call it just in time hiring, where you're able to, uh, on a dime, find and hire the people that you need to fill those roles very quickly. Uh, so you can flex and adjust uh, when the, when come up. I wanted to add just in time hiring. It almost sounds close to like like the gig economy, you know, like yeah. on demand jobs. Gig economy, and in fact, that's part of that's part of the solution. I think with just in time hiring, there's there's technology that plays into that. Um, a lot of auto automation can help speed up the hiring process. Hmm. Uh, automate those resume reviews or scheduling, um, yeah. but also contract to hire arrangements. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. big type arrangements allow for more flexibility and more risk taking. Uh, it can be scary to hire someone very quickly, um, especially if you're leaning on technology to do a, a heavy part of the hiring process. Um, but by doing a contract arrangement or a, a gig type arrangement, it can mm -hmm. really lower the risk of that step and give people an opportunity to prove themselves in the job. I see that's yeah. a big part of the future. And the fourth thing uh, the fourth big trend is, uh, is I'm going to use the word cyborgs. Cyborgs <laughs> are, you know, people who are augmented with technology. Yeah. We often talk about, you know, people's jobs being replaced by technology, and that's a scary thing. I see an increased trend towards people's jobs being augmented with technology, and that's a little less scary. It means you can do more. You can be more powerful and stronger than ever before. You can see things that other people can't see because you know how to use the technology. Uh, one of the benefits of using technology and people together, uh, you get the human, uh, kind of the best of the human intelligence, um, but technology can also reduce bias in our hiring processes and in our planning. Uh, I know there's a question on the panel that will, will come up in a minute around unconscious yeah, yeah. bias, but certainly leaning on technology uh, to, uh, to reduce bias is certainly one of the, one of the strategies here. Yeah. So I, I, the four, yeah, the four would be, more, you know, more availability of large scale data for forecasting, managing uh, proactively when there's a mm -hmm. supply and demand mismatch, uh, you know, ahead of time, moving to just in time hiring, um, and then augmenting your people with technology. Cyborg. The, the just in time part, it was a fascinating insight because the way you kind of put it is uh, what I know of like the gig economy is like the consumer jobs are being automated through like things like uh, you know, like like Uber style, right? So now you're seeing that bleeding into like higher caliber jobs or like enterprise level jobs getting automated. Is that the is that what your forecast is seeing? Yeah, um, you know the the more and more sophisticated technology gets, the more it can again not necessarily automate. Uh, are, are you talking about the automating of the hiring or the auto, or the augmenting? Well, of the well, I guess like from the way you were explaining it, the way I think about it is like jobs, like, like, let's say for example, Uber jobs, right? That is like the automation of like a very, uh, let's say a basic level type of role, right? But yep. then now you're, you're saying what you're communicating, what I'm interpreting is that that automation is increasing towards like a little bit more technical roles. It's, it's removing of the friction to hire. And that's where you'll get that just in time smoothing, smoothing out 
effect. Yeah, yeah. For just in time hiring, it's 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 removing steps of the process or automating steps of the process uh, or making them faster. Mm. Um, you know, so you know if you're relying on on people in a in a traditional process to source candidates, uh, screen resumes, uh, do phone screens, do ma manual interviews. All that stuff takes a lot of time. You got to schedule all that stuff, and it, it, there's a lot of time in that process. If you have an application that directly uh, delivers an assessment to you, and you can take an assessment uh, immediately after the application and go straight to a final round interview, right? That mm -hmm. shortens the process. So now right. it used to take three three weeks to get all the way through. Now you're at your final round interview the next day. And so um, that's right, what I mean right. by just in time hiring. And it can be really applied to, to any role, uh, especially roles where some of that assessment, <clears throat> excuse me, assessment and evaluation can take place in an online or uh, automated format. Yeah. Well, this and is all kind of benefit reducing the risk, the, the bias in the, in the assessment process. Yeah. <clears throat> this, this, is all, this is all great insights from uh, all the panelists that we have here, right? Suleen talking about data, uh, Graham talking about data governance. Uh, and then what is, you know, what is, uh, um, uh, what was I going to say? <laughs> Anyways, uh, I'd like to jump into the last part here, uh, which is the audience Q&A. Uh, so everyone's welcome to ask any questions as they, as they like. Uh, I do see that we do have one question, and I didn't get to read it all, but it has uh, to do with unconscious bias. So let's go around the panel. The question is, how does this panel feel people analytics can address unconscious bias? I mean, I, we, we start with anyone. Suleen, if you'd like to start. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it's such a big honor to be the first one to answer the question. Let me throw my hands here, right? So unconscious bias, I, you know, I can um, share my uh, takeaway before when I uh, help any organization to uh, do the organizational diagnosis either on their reorg or change management. So what I would like to do is the first step to conduct the interviews, formal or informal interviews with the key shareholders or key functional managers. While by doing those interviews, I notice there's always a bias, right? The bias is, does not mean HR professionals uh, you know, has their, her, his or her own feelings or the decision-making process, but we have to be practical. Everybody has a different type of, you know, work experience, expectation in terms, you know, the, uh, the result, right? So I'm thinking at that time, I was hoping, oh, if there's a technology can help me, I mean, at least can verify, you know, what, uh, I draw the conclusion, you know, it's kind of, you know, make logistic sense, that would be great. So I will say, you know, um, if it is possible, HR professionals should have the open mindset to align the technology when we make some important decisions in terms of like uh, organizational design or change management or even the leadership decision making. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, Al, any any comments on unconscious bias out there? Yeah. Oh gosh, yes. Um, <laughs> it is a really challenging topic. So the essence is this: we, we want to create a more fair um, opportunity for everyone and uh, get hired on their merits to do the job. And historically, there's been favoritism. There's been exclusion, exclusionary practices, and those are not good. Therefore. There have been solutions and processes and practices that humans actually employ to minimize um, unconscious bias and frankly, conscious bias as well. So um, does technology have a role? Absolutely. The two things, the algorithms are designed by people and with data that's generated by people. Um, so inherently there's going to be some algorithms that are going to form a certain position aka a kind of reverse bias if you will um is that ethical is that appropriate um most cases it is because it has virtuous intent it has a fair intent but that goes into point two the application of these tools has to be very thought through uh because 
if you are creating a or adopting a technology that is uh, intended to reduce, let's say, unconscious bias in hiring or internal development slash promotion, um, is it going to inadvertently exclude a certain population? Um, can, should there be uh, some human-based qualifiers? Um, so at the end of it, any technology needs to be put in a human process when it relates to people. And I will cite Prasad Seti, um, who I've had the great pleasure of, of knowing for guy close to 20 years now, uh, going back to when he was at Capital One. If you don't know Prasad, he came in to lead people on like the Google in the mid 2000s, probably 2006, 2007, and led people operations. And now he's doing future of work stuff there at, at Google. So he, when he first came on, he said, well, all people decisions are going to be based on data. And again, I'm butchering this, but he said, all people related to decisions will be made by people using data. So that nuance was very, very important. And I think it applies here when we're talking about um, unconscious bias technologies, um, that we have to put them within a human based process. So they're not misused, and they just don't go off and, you know, make erroneous assumptions and exclude a population or hurt a population um, inadvertently. Hmm. And then Graham, any uh, insight you can give on unconscious bias? Yeah, you know, I think we've talked a bit about, you know, technology and, and the role it can play in, mm -hmm. um, in reducing bias inherent in, in, in processes where, where people may inject biases and the dangers of using technology and leaning on technology to do that as well. Um, you know, it looks like Amy did a lot of work in her thesis, as she wrote in her question, around uh, measuring the impact of unconscious bias. And, and I would frame my answer in terms of the importance of measuring the unconscious bias that's there in our, in our, in our organizations. So doing things like salary reviews, um, leadership reviews, who, who is in your leadership uh, group, you know, and who's not in your leadership group? Um, how is your hiring process? Uh, so reviewing your hiring uh, pipeline um, are there key steps in your hiring process where certain groups start to be less represented, um, you know, after an interview stage or after an assessment stage, uh, or even, you know, uh, when they're applying to jobs, are they dropping out at that stage? And so by, yeah, I think just the first step is really understanding, is there bias and where is there bias? Of course there's bias, where is there bias? And uh, so that you can hone your solutions more specifically on on where the you know problems are um and where the where this where the solution is going to be applied mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay so we we have sort of a long-winded question here and i was trying to listen and then also read the question at the same time so i'm just going to read it just to make sure i interpret it right so the question is from jess she asks is anyone able to speak to how they would approach demonstrating roi of workforce investments in the public sector I'm considering barriers, uh, barriers public sector must overcome to even compete with private sector for talent, et cetera. That's true. And the innate advantage private sector has when doing workforce planning. Compared to private sector, public sector has much lower people planning budgets, less workforce data, especially historical, that could demonstrate change over time. And while not intending to generalize less analytic capability compared to private sector, all to say much less ability to measure the ROI and present a business case that workforce investments in planning for the future is critical. So uh, what I interpret is just basically the private sector is a lot more equipped than the public sector to deal with, let's say, ROI of workforce planning. So to boil down her question, uh, say you're starting a blank slate. What are the top considerations if an entity wants to begin measuring the ROI uh, and demonstrate effectiveness of their workforce investments? I'll take that if I may. Um, so uh, just real quick, uh, I've struggled with this throughout my career because I've been saying, okay, how's this training program drive sales or something like that? I mean, that's, there's a lot of what I would call intermediary variables from the intervention, aka investment and the downstream outcome. So what I would advocate is identify the intermediary variables as short as possible. And like in, in learning, 
it's, you know, go to Kirk, Kirk Patrick's assessment. You know, you can have data right after a, a training program or something like that. And, you know, do they actually like it? And is there benefit as a, you know, self-assessed? I mean, that's just one like very drastic example. For many, that's not going to hold a lot of water saying, okay, that's worth the investment just because people liked it. They might have liked the day off and liked the conversation, but is it going to actually drive organizational productivity? However, if you do, let's say, a training or a post-training survey three months down the road and say, okay, do you still like it? Is it helping you do your job better? If you survey the managers saying, okay, do you believe that training program has helped this population do their job better? So now you're capturing data that formerly didn't exist. That's appropriate for that particular um, investment. That's just one example. You can do that in recruiting. You can do that in uh, uh, communication, you can do it in org design, you can do it in resourcing, you can do goal setting. There's so many investments technologically and process interventions that uh, require, uh, let's say, a consultancy to come in and do that costs money. That's a workforce investment, arguably, or elevated compensation. Is that actually driving higher retention? So there's so many uh, scenarios, but really looking at the process, the change, understanding where the, what I would call the data collection points are and shrinking the causal chain. So if you have a causal chain from intervention to sales, that's a really extended causal chain. If you go, okay, here's a, a training program. Here's what the individual learner thinks. Here's what the manager thinks. Here's what say the customer thinks. Here's what peers think. Here's what uh, customer uh, satisfaction, uh, comp store sales thinks. Here's what the financial outcomes. So now you have a bunch of intermediary variables that start to tell a story around how that one intervention drove downstream outcomes. But that takes thought. That takes creativity. That takes resourcefulness and not everyone has the time or skills to, to make that happen. But again, finding the appropriate data, you know, the intermediary variables, as I just referred to them, is critically important to show the value of workforce investments. I have a, I have a pretty a pragmatic answer, which is, sure. you know, I, th I think the purpose of data is to make better decisions, yep. not perfect decisions. Yep. Mm -hmm. So don't Absolutely. let the perfect get in the way of the good enough. And, you know, using as Al, you know, suggested some intermediary uh, metrics or, or pieces of data um, using ranges. So if you're not certain of the exact number, you know, you give a range. Is it at least this and not more than this? Um, using proxies, like, I don't know, you know, how much my sales person is paid, but I know how much my you know, the salesperson at this other company might be paid or maybe customer service. And I know sales is paid more than customer service in my company. So it must be like this, you know, just like, guess, guesstimate based on some logical assumptions. Um, and sometimes using generic data, you know, just Google something and find a benchmark and that might be good enough to make your case. And at the end of the day, present your case, not as fact, but as, you know, uh, well-informed, um, you know, estimates and uh, in guidance, it's guidance. It's not, um, we're not trying to automate the decision-making by pushing a button and putting the data in and, you know, pulling out the answer. It's just about insights. Yeah, a, a quick add to that real quick, if I may, because um, you're absolutely right. At the end of the day in doing um, analytics, we're explaining the uh, process to a degree of confidence to, you know, we're not, providing certainty you know if we have situation a and we do intervention b you know is c going to result with 100 percent confidence absolutely not you know we have intervention uh, situation a investment intervention b you know c ha will likely result with you know 50 percent degree of confidence or something like that and if we explain the variability by 10 20 15 percent in some scenarios that's a win that's good that's better than zero which was you know before it's more bringing data to a hunch you know we've also often been called myth busters or myth validators in some case but yes the idea that we're shopping certainty is not a healthy mindset you know we're we're just going to help improve the confidence that leaders will have in or anybody has in in how best to move forward if you have an executive who 
you know, grills you on all the assumptions that you have. And, you know, and sometimes I'm this executive grilling my, my team as well. So I, I understand how that goes, but, you know, you can ask, what, it, what are you looking for? What is the range that would make you comfortable with making this investment? Um, and then you can probably show with a higher degree of certainty that you're falling within this range. You know, the, there's no reasonable assumption that we could make that's gonna get us lower than this or higher than this. So, you know, try to gauge what, what are we really talking about? How big of a di difference are we really talking about? And maybe, um, you know, you can get there by understanding that context. Yeah, I oh, go ahead. Comments. Yeah, so uh, even I from the private sector, but however, I respect public sector very much because uh, when I studied at Harvard Kennedy School, many of my classmates, they're from the Department of Defense, State of Department, federal government level. So for me, uh, I saw, you know, our federal uh, government or public sector employee, they are very mission driven, driven and compared with the private sectors, they are intend to be more loyal to their organizations, right? Mm -hmm. So if we talk about the ROI, well, let's use the data to talk compare the hiring cost, you know, to hire the people, job posting, interviewing time, make a decision, and then uh, the engagement, make sure this employee is, you know, maybe spend the 90 to 180 days to engage with the company's culture. And then this, uh, he or she start to make a contribution, right? However, compare all those related costs. What if we invest in the, just like Al mentioned, the training and the learning development, because uh, our employee in public sector already in the organization for so many years, he or she, they knew, you know, how is the company's culture, right? What's the policy or process? Therefore, if we spend some money on the investment and then can uh, help the company, like uh, uh, to help the employee to grow together with the organization, I think this is a win-win situation. And usually public sector has uh, many employees, right? Very large size. So if we can let the leadership know if we, we uh, leverage the technology, for example, the people analytic organizational network analysis, this type of uh, technology to help you know, the executive level, the leadership level to really understand what's going on with our organization. Who are the informal leaders, right? Who has a big intention to, uh, to be promoted, you know, one step or two step away, you know, from the, you know, the future, the senior director level. That can be very cost effective. Yeah. Thank you. So it, it sounds like we, you know, we talked a lot about data and, and measuring. I, I have a question myself, and I want to ask the last question here as well. Uh, is, would you say engagement data is probably one of the most important type of data out there when it comes to like, you know, workforce planning? Because I, I mean, if you're making all these investments into workforce and you're not measuring the engagement, where, where's the ROI? Uh, I'll, I'll take that real quick. So I'll just go back. The beginning of wisdom is calling things by their right names. So what is engagement? So engagement has been elevated as a proxy for a lot of things. And then there's, yeah, is it include discretionary effort or is engagement a driver of discretionary effort? Um, is it commitment to the organization? You know, how do you define it? Um, engagement usually is an index um, of four items uh, related to job satisfaction and commitment to the organization. And, and so by creating an index like that, you're effectively diluting the variability and you're flattening out. As a researcher, we want variability. And so uh, engagement, as I'll echo my colleague, Scott Brooks um, of Org Vitality, is necessary and not sufficient. And so I'm really interested in confidence. So confidence is an individual's belief in what is going to happen in the future. Am I confident that I'm going to develop my career intentionally? Am I confident this organization is going to be successful? Um, am I confident that my supervisor is looking out for me? And you know, all these things about uh, my belief in the future. So I like that construct. Um, what I think is absolutely more important, though, is we're talking about well-being now in the market. And I really want us to have that stick. That's different than engagement. I'm engaged in my work. I'm committed to my org, all fine and good. But am I okay? 
you know, Shin, Shinlin was talking about this earlier, you know, we have capacity constraints and we're asked to deliver, we're asked to perform, you know, am I able to do that? I, I often say I grew up in, uh, in what I call a suck it up generation. It's like, you're lucky to have a job. This is the way it is. Just go do it. And now, as we all talked about, there is in most job families, a gross mismatch. There's a way more demand than there is supply. So if I'm high value talent in a job family that with scarcity and my org isn't looking out for my well-being and capacity constraint, I got options. I'm out of here, you know, and that's going to happen. That's already being shown in the data. So if I'm going to be doing workforce planning and I have this talent acquisition strategy, this development strategy, and I'm not looking out for people's well-being and I have a host of assumptions about retention, it ain't going to work. You know, right, they're going right. to bail. In, you know, in so other that, words, you're saying like, you know, engagement is important, but it's not sufficient. The other part is like the relationship that you have with your workforce is also very important. Yeah. And I would package that in the well-being and confidence and they're yeah. all interrelated. Uh, but, you know, to think engagement is the most important, I would caution that. Um, mm. it's really, you know, employee experience is getting a lot of play and it will, I prefer worker experience because uh, I look at contingent labor contractors and others who are increasing gig economy. They're, they're doing work for organizations too. They're human beings too. I want them to have a positive experience along with employees. So yeah. really looking at the set of metrics that are throughout the employee life cycle that create the employee experience, which in my view, when you talk about culture, culture are merely the stories that people tell themselves about their experience at work. So am I having a good experience? I'm going to tell my friends and family, and that's mm. going to become my brand. And so that can be consciously Ex experience created. data. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's yeah. my, you know, experience. Yeah. So anyway, I, like I don't want to get overly long winded, but <laughs> it's uh, engagement is something that it's, it's important but it's not exclusive. It's not kind of the Holy grail. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, the one thing I'll throw in too, it's the frequency in which those metrics are gathered. So formerly when I grew up, we all did like once a year, once every other year, you get engagement data. Now it's like continuous listening, continuous dialogue, like real time. So, so now you have, you know, you're able to see trends over time, actually forecast trends based on interventions and what's happening in the external environment. So it's almost, almost it's not there but it's almost a continuous variable when you're looking at doing surveys monthly Teresa Welburn out of Michigan talks about a daily survey so you know we can collect better data and get a better pulse on where human beings are in, in the workforce and that is going to be essential moving forward okay I think I mean your, your question does hit on a really important point which is uh internal like our existing employee base is one of maybe the most overlooked uh parts of workforce planning. And uh, many times when we're talking to clients, um, you know, we, we, we hear them talk about their retention rate or their, you know, their fallout rate as just a given. And um, looking actively for ways to move that number, I mean, that, that can be a huge lever at a company, especially one that has historically high attrition rates. Yep. Uh, that can be a huge part of their future workforce planning. Um, one of the, one of the things, uh, we say at Indeed, which I, I like that I think is, you can be universally applied is we want your next job at Indeed to be at Indeed. Uh, and it's this idea of promoting internal mobility, you know, like you don't have to be on this team forever. You don't even have to be in this role forever. There's enough opportunities within the company. Um, you know, we want you to find something, uh, that, that is a good fit. And so that, that it can also be a part of your workforce planning strategy. Awesome. Hey, thank, thank you, everyone. So uh, I know we do have one last question. Uh, maybe we could answer it real quick in 60 seconds. Um, we'll go around real quick. How can we assure that people data support uh, us in decisions but are not violating people's privacy? How can we assure that companies and pro providers are not crossing the line? Basically, data governance. 60 seconds. Anyone could comment. <laughs> I think a good uh, organizational network analyst technology will apply the GDPR rules. And uh, based on my knowledge, uh, some of uh, those type of technologies uh, will not look into in the, like, uh, for example, not uh, we uh, analyze data, but not in the deep like attachment. So this is can give some insurance to the uh, potential companies who would like to apply these technologies. 
I would add absolutely. Um, I would also say that an organization needs to have an ethics charter around analytics. That's different than data governance and cybersecurity. This is really, hey, we have an analytics project to do. Is it going to compromise trust within this organization? So effectively having some gates it has to pass through in order to get done. Ultimately, I cite Salesforce, which I think is an undisputed leader in this um, space where if it's going to compromise trust, they actually have a trust committee where if it's going to compromise trust of the workforce, they're not going to do it. And I'll give you, a, they don't mm. predict um, turnover. Why? Why would you do that? That's not appropriate by their definition. And I frankly agree. So having some clear boundaries in the form of what I would call an ethics charter guidelines, then that is going to mitigate risk and elevate trust within the workforce that data is being used responsibly. I'll just add, like, again, my pragmatic perspective, you know, use the sniff test, which is if it smells bad, it's probably bad. You, know, <laughs> you can use your own judgment. Um, when you're thinking about how to use data and what kind of data you're, you're accessing to do your analysis, if it's data that you wouldn't feel comfortable sharing about yourself, uh, probably not data that you want to be using from someone else. So, um, you know, there's some element of just use your, use your common sense when you're doing it. Right. Okay. Awesome. Everyone. Okay. We're at top of the hour. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much, Sulian, Al and Graham, uh, and everyone else in the audience as well. Uh, thanks for checking out the second episode of uh, the Future of Work series. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you all. Well. Appreciate you. All right. Yeah. Be well. We'll connect. We'll connect on LinkedIn or something. See you guys. All right. Absolutely. All right. Have a good night. Bye.